Okay, welcome to the final Raspberry Pi class. Thank you guys for coming. Um, so tonight we're going to be walking through a couple of things. Most of them kind of pick up where we left off last week with getting Apache set up and our network config. So hopefully everyone's there at this point. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to kind of integrate some of our Twitter search code from two weeks ago into a little Python web app that we'll host via Apache. So um, a series of moving parts here. What we're doing tonight isn't necessarily the way you would do this if you wanted a big scalable server. It's kind of state of the art 10 years ago. Um, but there are better ways of doing this now. However, it is simple and straightforward and kind of the basis of everything we do today. So don't go off with these skills and expect to be able to run a website that's going to handle a thousand hits every minute, but they'll work fine for demonstrating and getting the more optimized versions kind of follow the same patterns. So what we're going to be using is a system called CGI, which is the common gateway interface. This is basically a way that you can tell Apache to run a program that you write to generate a web page, as opposed to this, the static web pages that we had last week. So last week we just had web pages that were HTML files, we just typed them statically, they were always the same thing in Apache Serve them. This week, instead of having static files, we're going to write a program, Apache's going to call that program, that program's going to build the website for us, hand it back to Apache, and Apache's going to serve that. So this allows us to do dynamic things like, well, we're going to be, the, the end game's going to be to essentially take our search code for Twitter from a couple weeks ago and build a little website where you can type in a search query, hit search, and it tells you how many tweets match it. Um, so very basic web app, that's the end game. We're going to be using Python and CGI to do it. Um, and again, CGI is kind of just the way we interface Apache with some program. You don't have to use Python for this. You could actually use almost any program. Um, CGI is the part that's kind of outdated these days. If you were doing this for your real, you would use something like Fast CGI, or there's some newer versions that complicate things a little bit, but have much better performance than what we're going to be dealing with tonight. So are there any questions before we get started? OK. So there are some links on the Foundation Program website for tonight. I should go to the one in particular. I should also start this. So if we go to the web page for tonight's lecture, and you guys don't necessarily need to go here. Um, so there's not a lot on here, but all of this should be on your SD cards already. The main thing that matters is that you already have the network set up like we did last week. Again, if you're using one of my SD cards, that's already done. That just involves setting a static IP and telling it to automatically connect to our little wireless network in here. Um, you're also going to need a copy of the Twitter alarm clock code from a couple weeks ago. Uh, that should already be, I already cloned that in all your directories. If you're Landon and you're not using one of my cards, you probably haven't done this yet. Is your internet working? Uh, not yet. Okay. Everything's broken for Landon. <laughs> but um, you'll need to do a clone on that. I can bring up that page. But other than that, uh, you can also download. I mean, if you're doing this later, there is a copy of the SD cards that you guys are starting with. The only difference is if you download this version, it doesn't have the network set up already on there. Um, because obviously that needs to be individualized for each individual card. So if you downloaded this version, you'd still need to change that interfaces file like we did last week, and then you'd be good to go. So the first thing we will look at is I bring up a terminal. So this is on my Raspberry Pi. And I actually have a copy of all the code we're going to be doing tonight inside the Twitter alarm clock folder. We're going to go ahead and rewrite it from scratch just for the learning experience. Otherwise, this would be a five minute class tonight. Um, but if you do want a, an end copy of what we're going to end up with, it is already inside the Twitter alarm clock folder. We'll look at that at the end. Um, for now, what we're going to do is start this from scratch. So on your SD cards, Apache's in its kind of unconfigured state. So uh, again, if you have a laptop or something, that'll come in handy because you can use it to access um, you can use it to access your Raspberry Pi. If not, someone else can help you test, or you can load from a Pi. You'll need to be connected to our local network in order to do this. So again, the local network, the SSID is our Pi testnet, I think, something along those lines. And the password is internet Pi. So if you connect your laptop to this, it'll be on the same network. Then you should be able to load the IP address associated with your Raspberry Pi. So if you're using one of my SD cards, your IP address is 192.168.0.1 followed by whatever the last two digits on your SD card number are. Mine actually breaks the pattern. Mine's at 33. 
Um, but if you guys were, so whoever has SD card number one would be at 0 0.101, whoever has SD card number seven would be at 0 0.107. So you should be able to load a basic web page like this. That's just Apache's default website. We showed you how to change that last week. We're actually going to be building on that um, to do our auto-generated website. So there's a system, like I said, it's called CGI, and basically the way it works is there is by default, all of this can be changed in the Apache config, but by default there is a directory called slash user slash lib slash CGI bin, and it should be empty on your guys' machines. Anything we put inside this directory, as long as it's executable, so a script or a program, um, as long as it's executable, we can put something inside this directory that is going to get called whenever we go to the web address slash CGI dash bin slash the name of the program. So if we had a program called start.py, we could run it by doing that. Right now it's going to fail because there's nothing in that folder, but we'll get to that in a moment. Any questions on this thus far? Okay, so let's go ahead and write a little Hello World CGI app. So in the editor of your choice, um, I'm gonna use Emacs, but you know, use whatever you want. Uh, and we, you can just do this in your home directory. So I'm gonna write a program called start.py. We'll worry about copying it to this directory in a minute. Um, so there's going to be a couple of things you're gonna want. I'm gonna look up a GitHub real quick because that's my notes. So what we're going to be writing is a simple Python script. So like most, most Python scripts, we're going to start with, you know, the Shaw bang that we want. And avoiding all my extra paste cruft. So your first line needs to just be a standard shoving. This just makes it an executable script. So this is how the operating system knows that when we run this, because it's a script, not a compiled program, the shoving is telling the operating system that when you run this file, call the Python 3 interpreter and pass it everything inside this file. So this is how we tell it's a Python 3 program. If we were using normal Python, we would just have Python there. That would give us Python 2.7. If we wanted to make this a bash script, we would have user bin bash instead of the environment here, so on and so forth. So that's just a standard way to start out scripts. Now what we need is the way there's some debugging we can put in here. This actually isn't absolutely necessary, but we're going to import a couple of packages which are going to come in handy. Actually, the only one we read right, need right now is the second one. So this CGI TB package is a package built into Python that essentially gives us some extra debugging with CGI scripts. Because when we run a CGI script, the script is running by Apache, uh, it can be kind of hard to debug. This package will generate nice error codes for us when we do something wrong to display on our page. If we were putting this in production, we'd probably want to turn this off, but as long as we're developing, this just makes our life easier if we make a mistake. Um, we then want to actually use that package, so we need to turn on debugging. That's what this next line does. So we just need to call cgitb.enable, that's just going to turn on this debugging package. Again, this is not required, this is just going to make our life easier if we screw something up, otherwise Apache would kind of just say there was a server error, it wouldn't tell us what we did wrong. With this turned on, it's actually going to tell us what's going on. So the way a CGI script works is essentially it's just going to use print statements to basically print the HTML that we want in our website. Um, but because it's programmatic, we can now print whatever we want. We're not stuck with some hard-coded HTML. Uh, but we do need to call a series of prints to essentially print our website. The first thing we need to print is actually part of what we call the HTTP header. This is just part of the CGI spec. But the first thing we print is any where we're going to print any of our header context. This is just going to tell when, our, when the web browser loads our page, this text slash HTML, this is how it tells it it's an HTML page. Normally this is done for you. When you have a .html file in Apache, it automatically generates this. If we wanted a plain text, we could do text.plain. There's a lot of things we could do here. This is just our content type header uh, that we need to specify. So this actually isn't part of our web page. The user's never going to see this. This is just something that gets passed to your browser so it knows what to do with the data that's coming to it. The next thing you do in a CGI script is you need to give it a blank line. 
This blank line is what anything before this blank line is parts of the header. So things like content type, there's other things you can specify here as well. Anything below this header is the start of the actual page itself. So now we can start actually printing HTML. So if we print something simple like, um, I mean, we can decide how good of HTML we want to write. We'll just open up our body tag and So I'm going to do a couple of prints here, and I just want to print a header. That says something like, it's working. So right now we're doing essentially what we do with a static website. We're not really doing anything programmatic here, but it is going to prove that our system is working the way we expect. If anyone sees me make a mistake to give a shout, because you know. This is kind of error prone. Uh, we should probably put it inside HTML as well. So it depends how sensitive your browser is. But for this to be legal HTML, we should have the HTML tags outside of it. And we should close that. Cool. So if we do that, um, so we save this file now. So if I exit this file, um, we'll see I now have this start.py file just sitting in my home directory. We need to do a couple of things to it before. So right now, it's just sitting in our home directory. We need to move it to that CGI bin file. We also need to make it executable. Right now, if I try to run this file, it gives me a permission denied because it's not set as executable. You can also tell because it's white, not green. It would be green if it were executable. So to make it executable, we need to use the chmod command. So if we do ls long form and run it on that file, so you'll see right now the permissions for this file. We have uh, the owner, us, has read write permissions. The group, which is also us, has read permissions. And everyone else has read permissions. We need to give execute permissions. And we actually want to give execute permissions to everyone because Apache runs as a user called www-data. So we need to make sure the everyone spot has execute permissions because it's going to be Apache that's running this for us. So we can do that by running chmod. There's a number of ways to do this. I'm just going to use the number form. So 755 is going to give write permissions to every one of these categories. Um, so chmod 755 start.py. If I run that command again, you'll see I now have the x's. So it's executable. It's also turned green. So now I can test it once. If I just run start.py, so we're not always going to be able to do this. Right now, we're doing pretty simple things. So it's going to run by itself. Eventually, we may get to the point where it only runs when it's actually Apache's calling it. But I can run this. And if everything works, it should spit out everything I'm printing to the screen like so. Keep it clear on this? OK. So now we actually need to put this in that Apache folder where it knows to look for it. Uh, like I said, in the Apache config, you can change where it looks. We're just going to stick with the default locations tonight. So we need to do a copy. And we're going to copy start.py to user bin, um, or not user bin, user lib. And then there should be a CGI bin folder. And if I run this right now, it's going to fail because this folder, only, only root has right access to this folder. So that's fine. It's as it should be. You don't want just anyone being able to decide what programs your web server is going to be running. That would be a pretty big security hole. So we're going to do this as sudo. And that will copy it over. We can confirm that it got copied. So if we do an ls-al on the user lib CGI bin folder, we'll see that it is sitting there. And we now should be ready to go. So is everyone good on this? OK. If we were doing this for real, we would probably change the owner not to be root. We'd probably change it to be www data, which again is the person Apache runs on. It's just slightly more secure that way. Running it as root is kind of dangerous. Um, but we won't worry about that right now. Let's now see if it's working. So if we do the same thing again, if you go to the IP address for your Raspberry Pi, slash cdgi dash bin slash the name of the program. So in this case, start.py, live demo time. Ah. It worked. So I run mine, and it displays it's working. You guys should all be able to get the same thing. Um, I'll pause here for a moment. We can see if anyone's having trouble. I can test other people's, too. If you guys don't have a laptop and you just want to tell me what IP address you want me to load, shout them out. Anyone? What number? 109. OK. 
so something's broken on yours. Um, I will look, just a sec. Anyone else want me to test theirs real quick? This probably means, so normally you'll get a nice error message here, unless, did you run your program by itself on the command line? Uh, I did, yeah. And did it work? It did. That is a little bit strange. Let me look. choke on this because that's not privilege technically, but let's try this. Okay, so you'll need to make it executable. So chmod 755 start up the line. And then you'll need to do sudo so cp and then use object to once. Yeah, then direct your huh? so Yeah. Oh, and then I'll start up the line. So we're copying into that CGI bin directory. So user with CGI bin. Where's the high code? Yep. Okay. <laughs> now it should work if you pull it I, out. Wait, wait, I shouldn't have to do that in Python, actually. Really? Yep. Okay, you have your IP address slash CGI bin. Are you sure? Anyone else having trouble? Almost certain. Is this your uh, working now? Exactly or I'm sure. I'm sure. you need to test it? Let me know you want me to test it again. Okay. It works on there. But did you move it into there? Oh yeah, I probably save that here. Yeah. yeah. Remember, if you guys are editing, you need to copy over your edits every time before you run it again. Any other questions? Can I move on? Going once. We can take a look at it. Um, okay, so if I go, if I go back to mine real quick and <laughs> confirm that it's still working. Oh, did I break my network? Okay, good. Okay, so if I go back and take a look at mine, so right now we have it just generating a very basic website. That's kind of boring. We want to do something a little bit more interesting. So I'm gonna edit mine again. Do, 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 do. And if our end goal is going to be to build a website that, um, if our end goal is to build a website that we can type in a search query and run the Twitter search, it's actually going to be in two separate sites. So this first site is basically just going to give us a place to type in the search query and hit submit. And then the second page will be the page where we actually display the results. So let's start making these modifications. Um, 
This is where I'm going to make liberal use of my copying. So we could just keep doing, you know, separate prints on every line like we have been doing. That's fine. It's sometimes a little bit easier just to declare a variable that holds all of your HTML. So that's what I'm going to do now. So up here at the top, I'm just going to create a variable that stores all my HTML. So I just made a variable called page. I'm using the triple quotes in Python, which will allow me to do multi-line strings. Uh, this is just a doc type. This, uh, you don't necessarily need this, but it's good to have if you want it to be proper HTML. This is just telling it to use HTML. Actually, it's telling it to use HTML5. Then we have pretty much the same thing we had before, only this time it's all on one line. Um, so open up your HTML tag, open up your body. We now have a form, so this part matters. Uh, the action's going to be search twitter.py. So it's essentially that's the command, that's the website it's going to call when we submit this form. So that'll be the next page we make. We haven't made that yet. Method's going to be post. That's just basically telling it what to do when we click submit. Then I just have a header that so says Twitter search. I have a paragraph that says enter a search query. Then I have an input. So this is something new again. This is going to be a text field. Input type text. Name's going to be query. Uh, you can make the name whatever you want. Remember it because we're going to need it on the next page. Um, and then, and like I, they're actually, I can show you guys how to get a copy of this if you don't just want to type off mine. But uh, then at the very bottom, we're going to need a button. So the input type is submit. The value is going to be search. That's just going to what it's going to say on it. And then we need to close out our tags. So if people don't necessarily just want to type this. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> Fine, I'll leave it up. <laughs> Apparently, you do want to just type this. Um, in that Twitter alarm clock folder in your home directory, if you check out the CGI, the web-CGI branch, so if you go into that directory and do get check out CGI-web, then there's a folder called CGI, and my start.py file is inside of it. So you could conceivably go there and grab it if you needed it. And sorry, do make sure you have make sure you have page equals at the top because otherwise you're just typing Python. If it's not green, you've done something wrong. You're missing a quote or something somewhere. Yeah, it should be a triple quote at the top and a triple quote at the bottom. Yeah, that's what open and closes your that open and closes a multi-line uh, string in Python. Can I scroll down? Can I just shrink my text? Does that make people happy? Um, oh, come on. Don't do that to me. I want a finer grain page break. All right, well, Emacs is going to be finicky and not split it quite right. But there's the top. Good. If you know HTML, go to town on this as well, right? This is my basic ass HTML. Can I find this in Git? Yes. Cool. Um, so now we need to change the bottom. So we're going to keep the first part because the content type is still what we want. But now we're just going to print whatever we called our string. So I named it page. That's what this page equals up here does. So we're just going to have one print command that's basically going to print everything we had there. So we're going to save this. I'm going to close it. So if you do want to just grab a copy of this, if you CD into your Twitter alarm clock directory, so it's not there by default because you're on the master branch. If you do a git branch, We'll see we're currently sitting on the master branch. We want to be on the web CGI branch. So if we just do a git checkout, checkout web CGI. OK, so if you run that command, and then if we do an ls, you'll see you now have a CGI folder. And inside that CGI folder is a copy of my start.py, which should pretty much match what I had. But either use that one or use the one we were using a minute ago. So I'm going to go back to my original one. So uh, I'm still going to run this once. I don't know if it's going to still work for me. But I'm going to go ahead and run it and just to make sure that Python doesn't choke on it. Um, 
Okay, so it's still spitting mine out. You should be getting something like this, content type at the top. You should have at least one or more line breaks after it. Then you can have your HTML down below. Yeah. Is that part of the header, the first print? Yes, before these first line breaks is your header. So we're only specifying the content type. We could specify other header fields so here as well. Header? Uh, well, it's gonna, Apache's gonna tack on some oh, other okay. stuff for us, like it's automatically gonna add a content length and stuff like that. Um, this is just the user specified parts of the header. If you specify something here, it'll override Apache's default. Okay. Even if we left this out, Apache would probably, well, it might choke, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you could, if you had other, other header fields that you wanted to hard code, you could specify them here. Cool. Okay, so if you got that running, same deal. So we need to copy it to the directory, so sudo cp, start.py user slash user slash lib slash cgi dash bin. And it should overwrite our old copy. Now if I go back to my web browser and if I refresh again. Cool. So you should now be getting something that looks approximately like this. So I had my header, I had my inner search query, I have a box to type it in, and I have a search button. Now, if I try to use this search button right now, it's not going to work because, as we can see, maybe, the search button's trying to load this search twitter.py page. That's what we specified when we said form action equals. Um, we haven't written the search twitter.py page yet or the search twitter.py program yet. So that's now what we're going to do. We need to go write that program. Any questions on this first page? Is it working for anyone? Is it broken doll hell? Good. It's working for one person. I'm not full of total shit. Um, okay. So let's go back to the editor. So now we need to create a second file. Um, and we, I mean, we can call it anything we want, right? But unless we want to change that first one, our first file, we said we were going to call it search twitter.py. So let's stick with that. And here's where grabbing some code from the Git's gonna be handy. You're not just gonna wanna copy all of my code on this because we're gonna be copying some of the code that we used before. So I'm actually just gonna split my screen. So I'm gonna open up um, the copy I have in Git. So I'm gonna go to Twitter search. And open up search Twitter. Okay, so same deal as before. Our first line needs to be, uh, needs to actually call Python. So our Sha Bing line will call Python. Then we have a series of imports. We actually probably have more here than we need, but uh, I just copied these from the Twitter alarm clock. So we're gonna be importing a handful of stuff. We're not actually, we're not actually using most of this stuff. Maybe I'll cut some of it out. Um, I don't think I'm even using sys time sub process. We do need JSON, we do need CGI, we do need HTML. So then this code I ripped straight out of the, uh, this code is ripped straight out of the Twitter alarm clock from a couple weeks ago. So we need to copy our, these are essentially just our constant variables telling a member we're using the Twitter search API, so these are just giving it the API. I'll go back to a single screen. So this is just giving it the API. Um, so it's telling it this is where you go to search Twitter. My, it's giving it my max length, max number of results, so on and so forth. So that's just stuff I need to specify again that came right out of that Twitter alarm clock code from a couple weeks ago. Um, now we need that count tweets function also from a couple weeks ago. So this is the exact same function we were using a few weeks ago. I'm not going to go through it all again, but essentially you pass it some query and it counts the number of results up to 100. If there's more than 100 results, it just returns 100 because we never got fancy and coded it to handle multiple pages. But this is the function that's actually going to search for us. So that's all fine. Now we need to get down to, we can start writing, well, we, we have a choice. Eventually we need to start doing print statements because just like the previous page, we give our output to Apache via print statements. Um, we can actually do the computation first and then do all of our print statements last. I think that's how I structured it. So here's where things start to get a little bit new. Um, well, just like before, we're going to enable the debugging. So that just turns on CGI TV. That just enables debugging. Then I have a couple of variables here. So I actually split up my page this time. 
Whereas before I had it all in one big variable, this time I'm splitting it into two. The first one called page start, which has the first half of the page up to this search results header. And then I have a page end, which basically makes a link back to the first page and then closes everything. The reason I'm splitting this in half is because I want to, these are still constant strings, but I want to programmatically generate what goes in between. So I'm splitting this into two strings so I can print the first one, then I can print whatever my program is actually computing, and then I can print the last one. Make sense? So again, I basically just split in half what we did on the other page. So we're that far. Uh, now this is where the code starts to actually use some of that CGI stuff from the CGI library. So if you'll notice, we actually imported, whereas on the first page, we only imported this CGI TB, which is the debugging library. Now we're importing the actually the CGI library as well. What that allows us to do is when you submit something in HTTP, so on that last page, we have that query box, we type something into it and we hit submit. That data is now available to us on this page, but we need a way to grab it. When you use a post submit, that data actually gets passed in the headers of your HTTP request. So we don't want to like go start parsing headers directly. Instead, the CGI library basically gives us all of this for free. It makes it easy for us to deal with. So we have this form equals CGI field storage. So this is just a Python class that basically gives us a uh, gives us a a form that we can then access fields inside of. Um, so we're going to run that to set that up. And then we actually need to grab the field we want. So we're going to use this git first. So now we want to get the actual string the user typed in. So we're going to just call it user query. We're going to call this get first method from the form object we generated up here. And this needs to match whatever we called the field on the first page. So on that first page, we called the field query. If I open that back up. So you'll notice the input text right here. The name equals query. So whatever the user types in here, we're going to grab by calling query on the next page. If we had called this, you know, my user input, we would be doing form.get my user input on the next page. If you had multiple inputs, this name is how you would differentiate between them. We only have one input, so that's fine. So we called it query, so we want to grab the query here. So this is saying whatever the user typed in in the query field, grab it and save it to this user query variable. <clears throat> so we now have what the user typed in. So now we actually want to call type count tweets. So we're just going to pass that query directly to our count tweets function. This is the same thing we were doing a couple weeks ago. Only a couple weeks ago, we were typing in a query on the command line and passing it. Now we're typing in our query on a web page and passing it. Same concept. So we're going to pa pass in our query. We're going to save the output in this tweet count. And now we can get to the actual generating of output. So there's some security things we need to consider here. Come on, work. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. All right. So there's some security things we need to do deal with here. Let me open up my other file again. So the first thing we want to do is sanitize the user's input before we print it back to the screen. So we let the user type in whatever they want in that query field. This exposes us to a security risk. If the user started typing in HTML code, and if we just printed that right back out on the next page, we would basically allow the user to insert code into our web page that would then run. Um, it's not a huge deal on this website because only the user themselves would be able to see it. It's not like we saved that state and display it to every other users. But if we added a part to our website that like saved everyone's search query, so whenever you visited, you could see all of the previous queries other people had run, and someone injected some code into our website that we're now then displaying, especially if they include like some JavaScript, they can essentially start running their JavaScript on other people's website or on other people's web browsers. So this is called a cross-site scripting exploit. Um, the way you avoid it is pretty simple. We just need to escape the user query. So whatever the user gave us, we're going to go through it and we're going to basically put escapes in front of any of the HTML. So even if they tried to write HTML code, this is going to tell the browser to ignore it. So we just want to clean it up. This is just uh, it's sanitizing their input before we display it again. Um, this is standard practice pretty much any time you're using user input and redisplaying it. 
uh, you need to sanitize whatever the user put in before you display it, lest you allow them to start programming your website for you. So that's what this HTML.escape does. It just says take the user query and escape any HTML that may be inside of it. So that's just going to clean up our user query. Note that we're going to call this after we call tweet count. We actually want count tweets to get the raw version of the query. It has its own cleaning inside of it. So we're not going to do the sanitization until after we call count tweets. But now we can go ahead and sanitize it. We want to, then we can actually start our printing. So just like before, the first thing we need to print is any headers we want. So we just want one header. It's the content type and HTML again is for our text. Then we're going to print the body. So our body in this case is going to be, so we're going to start by printing page start and page in. So that's what I had up above. So if we just print this right now, uh, we're going to get essentially search results and then a link back. We're not actually going to display the search results. So this is just printing those strings that I specified up above. Now we want to put the line in the middle that actually prints our output. So I'm going to put one more print line. Inside of it, I'm going to use HTML. So I'm going to start a paragraph and I'm going to say there are. Then I'm going to print the string version of whatever tweet count returns. This is going to be our number of tweets. Then I'm going to concatenate it with the tweets related to, and then I'm going to print their search query back at them. Um, the re since I've made their search query back, back, them, back, back at them, this is why I need the escape up here. If I left this out, I, there'd be no reason to escape it. But because I'm actually going to be displaying it again on the web page, I need to escape it first. Then I'm just going to close my paragraph, and then I'm going to go to the end of the page. Questions on any of this? OK. So I'm going to close this. I'm going to go ahead and run it, but it's almost certainly going to choke. Uh, before I run it, I need to change the permissions again. So chmod 755, search Twitter. So the reason it's going to choke is because this is going to try to go find that query input. But because I'm running it standalone, there is no query input, right? It's not actually inside a CGI framebook. So it's not going to do what we expect. But it will tell me if I screwed something up, like it looks like I did. So it should at least run Python. I think I screwed up my Sha Bang line. Stop being so slow. OK, let me open it back up. Oh, yeah. So I must have accidentally pasted all this crap before my Sha Bang. Let me get rid of that. Save it again. Run it again. OK, fine. So it's running. It's crashing. But that's global name parse not defined. Uh, Wait, so I did break something. I probably missed an include that I needed. I got overly zealous in stripping out my includes. Come on, Emacs. OK, uh, I think I need to import a parse here. I'm going to open back up the other one and look at it. If you guys are using my code directly, I already know that it works. Uh, this is just me retyping it wrong. Uh, yep, so I need these two that I left out. OK. So let's save that. Let's run it one more time. Why do I keep screwing that up? So eventually, I'm going to start getting errors that are OK. They're just from it not having what it needs. You'll notice that its error is printing me as HTML. That's because I have that debugger turned on. So this is just so it displays nicely when I actually run it. This might be OK. OK, I think this is just because it's blank. So let's go ahead and copy it over. So if I do a sudo cp, search Twitter, and I'm going to copy it to user lib lib cgi bin. And now we can try to run it. So 
I don't want to run it directly because it needs input. So I'm going to go back to this first page. I'm going to search for something. I'm going to click search. And it's, ah, oh, cool. So it's working. So it's displaying back there one tweet related to Andy Saylor. And that's just because I've only tweeted once in the last week or so, which is all it looks for. And if I perform another search, it should take me back to the first page and I can repeat it again. So this first page doesn't actually need to be CGI. Um, doesn't need to be a Python script at all. This is just static. So we could have just made this page in HTML and just had the second page be the CGI because that's the only place we're actually doing Python code to really compute the, the call to into Twitter and stuff. Um, but you know, if we try another search, so if I search something like CU, we can see it's probably going to be over 100. So it's just going to tell me there's 199 tweets. OK. There are 99 tweets related to CU. There's probably a joke there somewhere. Um, but I could keep going back and forth now, right? Um, I could do whatever else I wanted to do. So if I wanted to get more complex, I wanted to start to actually display the tweets, right? I could go into that second script. I could change my count tweets function to actually hand me back the tweets as well. And then I could start printing them down here, so on and so forth. All you have basically have to do is whatever input you're generating, you just have to wrap it in HTML elements before you output it. And you can essentially do whatever you want to do. Are there questions on this? So if you look at my directory real quick, um, so if we actually go into the Twitter alarm clock directory, and like I said, if you switch to the, if you're on the web CGI branch, uh, I actually also have a little install script called install.sh. All this does is it just copies them to the default directory. So this just saves us having to do the copy manually. Um, I can run it up there. But I have this install.sh script, so I can run it once. All this is going to do is basically overwrite my manually generated copies that I copied over with my default ones. So if you just wanted a quick and dirty way to get this up and going without having to manually copy, if you just come in here, and if you just run sudo install, you do still need to be sudo because we're still copying them to that protected directory. This is going to automatically copy the scripts. So it's not going to change anything for me, but that would copy over both the search Twitter and the start.py. So if I refresh this, it's going to ask me, we'll go back to the first page. So if I run the search again, hopefully it's still working. Okay, cool. So you'll notice that this is kind of slow. Uh, it takes a few minutes to load each page. A little bit of that is the fact that it's running on the Raspberry Pi. Most of that is the fact that CGI is just slow. Um, there are a lot more efficient ways of doing this. So like I said, we're waiting a second or so for this to generate each page for us. One way, the first page we could speed up easily. It doesn't need to be CGI. We could just make it pure HTML. That would be a lot faster. The second page does need to be CGI, but we, I mean, it doesn't actually, there, there are alternatives. So if we made it fast CGI, or there's also something in Apache called Mod Python, which kind of just allows you to, in, Apache to interpret Python code directly. Those are both a lot faster than the CGI that we're using right here. So if you're actually doing this in a production website, we would convert this to a fast CGI script or something. The concepts are the same. There's a little bit more infrastructure. You can't just start printing. You basically have to have a function where you save everything to a string, and then that function returns that string. And that's what Apache uses instead of just printing things like we're doing right now. So CGI is the easiest. We have faster ways of doing this now. It is kind of the least efficient. Um, but that's the basic gist. You can now go forward with you know, writing a web app that does whatever you want. Um, so we got a half an hour left. I'm going to let you guys play around, and I'll stick around if people have questions or want to do other things with this. Uh, are there any questions? All right. Well, thanks for coming to the classes. I'll be around for the next half an hour. We can take a look at things. Uh, and if anyone's having problems, I can help with that. If people just want to play around, this code's on GitHub, too, so you could fork it or branch it uh, or whatever you want to do if you wanted to start modifying it directly, so on and so forth. All right. Thank you, guys.